start with my own RF journey. And um, I was uh, basically always fascinated by how antennas work and how EM waves propagate through space. And uh, one of the things that really uh, drew, my, drew my interest in RF was, uh, you know, reading microwave, in, uh, reading microwave engineering by Peter Rizzi while I was studying antenna and wave propagation, because it really helped me visualize uh, Maxwell's equation. So, uh, you know, so reading, discussing, asking everyone questions, you know, asking ma'am questions, asking, uh, uh, I, gu I guess uh, you guys may not know Sundarajan sir, but uh, asking him, you know, a lot of things and really helped me understand things much better. But it, it was uh, the projects that really uh, helped deepen, uh, you know, connect the dots between concepts and implementation and things like that. And so my final year project was uh, on a 70 megahertz band bus filter. And that it, as simple as it sounds, but it was really fundamental in getting all these concepts shared out. Uh, and then after I finished my bachelor's, I got the opportunity to work with uh, Sundarajan sir for some more projects. And uh, this helped heighten my interest in RF and get hands-on real world experience. Um, I completed, uh, I graduated in uh, 2008. Uh, and then in 2009, I uh, pursued uh, masters and in 2011 I completed my masters in electrical engineering and um, I pursued some uh, courses in wireless RF and uh, just to get an overall idea of what is going on and then for the past nine years I've been working for Nokia in the field of RF circuit design and developing prototypes from uh, basically from paper all the way to production in a factory and um, so my expertise is really in, is in the area of uh, RF circuit design, but uh, uh, in the area of high power uh, power amplifiers. And um, there are many types of power amplifiers. So one of the things that I'm specialized in is Doherty power amplifiers for LDMOS or GAN based devices for base stations. And um, okay. Uh, I'm going to start covering more material. Uh, so uh, one of the things is why is learning microwaves important? And uh, basically, uh, you know, so you don't go hungry. You know, uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, but but it, it is fundamental that you know you you understand that you know uh, uh, that how you can design and analyze microwave circuits like amplifiers, uh, it could be small signal, it can be large signal, uh, large signal in the sense that it can be a power amplifier for, you know, 40 watt, 60 watt, or 100 watt radio, it can be for uh, a small, uh, low level chain, you know, like one watt, less than half a watt, it could be for a phone, you know, so it just depends on the application, you can design oscillators, and you, you can design all sorts of things. And um, and then and if you look at your world around you today, everything is going wireless. You know, we are connected more than we ever were, even I would say even ten years ago. You know, so we are in this age where communication is key, and you can kind of see all the applications around us are heading in the same directions. Like uh, a good example I can give you is. Um, there is a lot of push going on to move from a 4G network to a 5G network. And uh, that is pretty much desired because of, uh, you know, high data rates and very small latencies. And it's desired just because there are people around the world, there are consumers around the world who are actually consuming that much data, who are really wanting to go that far. And so the whole, the whole idea is, you know, at some point you'll just be relying on your, uh, you know, your mobile communication because it's going to be so much faster that it's going to be even faster than your home internet, 
you know, and so, um, but uh, what does that mean from a, a microwave perspective is one of the reasons is uh, uh, high data rate uh, requires very high bandwidth. And the only way you can achieve these high bandwidth is you have to combine large spectrums of frequencies so you can get more bandwidth. So one of the ways uh, you can do that is you have to go higher and higher in frequencies uh, so that you get more percentage bandwidth uh, to play with. And so uh, I'm gonna show you some uh, frequencies in a while. And so, so how do we implement that? You have evolution in material physics. You know, you have smaller, low loss, high speed silicon and chipsets and uh, highly directional antennas and antenna patterns and high density, high power, high frequency, and wide band devices like power amplifiers, receivers, mixers, and all these, all these are operating in uh, microwave frequencies. And so they're stringent, uh, you know, even if you look at uh, RF filter design, there are stringent wide band high frequency filter designs because there are so many spectrums around you that you want to make sure that you're only transmitting in the spectrum that you're allowed to and not in your neighbor's spectrum. For example, you don't want your Wi-Fi to be operating in the same network as you know, Bluetooth or something like that. You know, you want something unique and a unique frequency. And so, um, so why why is this uh, so why is this important? And you know, why is understanding microwaves important? And you know, uh, uh, just quickly is uh, microwave theory is uh, very mathematical and and I would say abstract in a way. Uh, but uh, I think once you start visualizing it using, you know, antennas or visualizing using circuits or visualizing uh, in a 3D way or a 2D way, uh, you can start to appreciate the, the concept more. Like as, as an example, you know, uh, like if you take a basic Maxwell's equation about uh, of, you know, a two delta B is equal to zero the divergence of uh, the magnetic flux is zero. And that's basically zero just because, you know, you can never have a magnet in which a North Pole exists by itself. It always occurs in a pair. And so, you know, things like that. And uh, the best way to understand, uh, you know, is looking at the theory in light of the final application, like a microwave oven or a base station on a cell tower, cell phones, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, et cetera, or even, getting simple concepts like, uh, but they're core and they're fundamental, like skin depth, uh, what is boundary condition and, you know. So first thing is a concept. The second thing is the application. Um, and uh, if you look at any application in the industry, is all these concepts come together, electromagnetics, mobile communication, all the RF concepts, uh, EMC, EMI, uh, microwaves, uh, antennas, you know, material physics, control systems. And as you, it's like looking at an onion and as you start peeling the layers and you go deeper and deeper, you will, you know, you will always find that you, not only do you have to interact with the RF and the microwave portion of it, you also, as you start going deeper, you also have to interact with all these other subsystems that sit on your, uh, communication chain. And so um, another thing is concept application and then third part is implementation. So how do you now take this and actually implement this on a PCB or, uh, you know, as a waveguide or whichever way you choose to implement it, you know, or as a filter, which can have these resonators inside that give you that cavity resonance. And, uh, like, how do you go from realizing something from on paper in a Smith chart to implementing it on a PCB or, you know, do you pick a microstrip line? Do you pick a waveguide? You know, what about EMI, EMC? You know, how do you realize something like a splitter or a combiner or a circulator or an amplifier? Um, 
And then the fourth part is instrumentation. Uh, instrumentation, so concept application implementation, the fourth part is instrumentation where uh, knowledge of, you know, RF test equipment, you know, how do you measure, uh, how do you make sure that your measurement is accurate, you know, understanding uh, a vector network analyzer, you know, and how to use it, you know, understanding basic things and, you know, what is return loss. And I'm sure you guys know that, but, you know, uh, uh, and uh, I would say finally, and finally, uh, experience, you know, and experience is nothing but just investing hours in, you know, putting together everything, the concept, the implementation, verification, testing, debugging, and, you know, uh, trying to meet or comply with, uh, trying to meet and comply with uh, the standards that are required. So, uh, so a, a 10 foot view would be, you know, what are you trying to achieve? In the end, you're trying to communicate. And so how do you implement that? You know, you have a communication system, so you can have your PA, your filter, your circuit, uh, your antenna, your digital baseband, you know, you can have your mixers, all these things together. And then, you know, you can go deeper, you know, how do I combine split power? What modulation scheme am I using? You know, is it 8PSK, is it 32 qualm? Uh, all these play a role. Uh, and then, you know, just working with things like power budget, signal to noise ratio, intermodulation, and all these things. And so uh, I'm gonna make sure I have enough time. Okay. Um, so what are the modern trends and what is currently happening? Uh, so the modern trends are, uh, we have 5G, like I spoke about 5G has a lot of things in it, uh, encompasses a lot of things like uh, millimeter wave. Millimeter wave basically means uh, um, the wavelength is between, the wavelength of the EM wave is between uh, one to 10 millimeters. And so that's millimeter wave. And then uh, you have massive MIMO. Uh, uh, MIMO is just multiple input, multiple output, but massive MIMO is just a lot of elements that, and there's a lot of uh, flexibility with massive MIMO. And then you have wider bandwidth. And uh, some of the other things are like Internet of Things, uh, which I'm sure you're hearing quite a lot about instrumentation. There are a lot of spectrums that are opening for commercial radios. And then there are wireless sensors, RFIDs and applications. And there's material physics uh, like silicone, silicon germanium, gallium nitride. Uh, there is a lot of work being done in the medical field, like MRI, biomedical, bioengineering. And there's a lot of work done in defense and a uh, lot of work done in surveillance systems, uh, nanotechnology and applications. And you have phase array antennas, smart antennas. There's a lot of work being done on antennas also. Uh, and then, uh, integrated systems like system on chip. And uh, the whole idea is, you know, now we are trying to absorb as much, not only are we getting smaller, we are trying to add more and more things. And in order to do that, you need, uh, like as an example, for example, when, when the data rates go higher and higher, even when you design a chipset, the chipset is also going almost uh, in a frequency range that's close to microwave. And so what is happening is now you have to be careful how you design that and you need to have a lot of RF engineers. By the way, every time I say RF microwave, uh, I mean one, it's one and the same thing. Uh, I'm just using it interchangeably. So uh, bear with me. Uh, and then, uh, so I'm gonna hone in on 5G, but I, I just wanna, hmm. In some time, I can show you some things. Uh, so some of the 5G use cases that are driving is, uh, you know, VR, AR, uh, 
these live experiences, you know, like for example, uh, a simple example is, you know, if you go to Google Maps and you're trying to do a street view, uh, you can get that 360 degree uh, live experience where you can see that you're almost walking down the road yourself. But if you're trying to do this on your phone, it requires very high data rate. And so, and you know, that, that high data rate again transfers translates to you requiring very high bandwidth. And again, which means that you need high frequencies, you need focused approach where you have, you know, where you choose different low band frequencies, mid band frequencies, and very high band fre uh, frequencies together to give this uh, experience. Uh, you have vehicles, you have cloud robotics, you have capacity, upgrade, you have smart stadiums, you have machine uh, remote controls, you have video surveillance, you have e-health, and even fixed wireless access. Uh, you know, so what is all this like, you know, like as an example, cloud robotics would be, you want to automate the production line uh, in a company. And, you know, in order to automate it, you can actually have machines communicating with each other via machine learning and all this is very heavy uh, data intensive uh, application. And so, so what is really driving 5G is uh, ultra wide bandwidth, um, edge computing, the latency requirement is less than a millisecond. So it's so small. And again, the data rate is greater than 10 gigabits per second. And you want high reliability, you want massive connectivity, increased efficiency, and at the end, everybody wants to save money. And, uh, okay, uh, let, me, let me go ahead and share my screen. Just wanna show you something. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to share my screen. Okay. Just wanted to show you guys a video. Uh... It's not audible. Probably you have to share your uh, speaker volume also. Oh, okay. Hmm. Okay, let me share. Okay. Five G will change everything. Can you hear it?
all that we can do and be. Come with us. A 5G world is waiting. Okay. Let's share one more video. What we're looking at is a complete transformation of the way we see wireless networks today. So 4G was really all about communications with people and delivery of video. And with 5G, I think what we're going to see is a complete transformation where we're talking more about connectivity for machines so that they can transform our lives and deliver services um, much faster, much quicker than we could ever perceive today. With 4G today, there's higher latency in the network. So this is the amount of time it takes to transmit data from the device to the network and back again. With 5G, that communication path will allow you to communicate much quicker and you'll be able to control machines. So in this demonstration here today, we have um, this camera which is recording the position of this ball on this plate. And then this position is recorded by a mobile edge cloud computing environment that then is intelligently controlling these robots, sending them the commands across the network to balance this ball on the plate. In this first demonstration, you can see on the screen here behind me, we're showing the current latency of what would be a 4G network. It's around 90 to 100 milliseconds. And on the right-hand side, you'll be able to see this line move as we move the ball on the plate. So what I'm going to do is move this ball right now, and we can see the oscillations here tracked on this graph and how long it takes for the robots to collaborate with each other to get the information they need to balance the ball on the plate. And then we're going to switch into 5G mode. And we can see on this graph here that we've now gone from around 90 milliseconds to around 3 milliseconds, so much, much lower latency in the network. And I'm going to do exactly the same again. And we can see that we only took one oscillation there to correct the ball. So you can see how the reduction of the latency in the network improves the communication between the machines, which is critical for future networks. I think for society, for humanity as a whole, what we're going to see is a transformation of our um, existing technologies to automate everything. So you can imagine healthcare, automotive, or in the mining industry, or in other areas that are very uh, critical or dangerous for humans. We can actually send a machine in and actually control them remotely over a 5G wireless network because of that low latency in the network. So a huge transformation in the way we utilize our, our network and what we're able to control and do with our machines. Okay, uh, let me see, let me share again. Uh, so, what, what, I mean, uh, so basically, you know, uh, my point, point to show that video was that you're talking about really, really high data rates and you're talking about really, really high uh, bandwidths that are required uh, to support this. And, you know, it has to be instantaneous. To support all these applications is what is driving uh, uh, millimeter wave, what is driving uh, all these other bands. And when I say millimeter wave, I'm just saying millimeter wave is just makes it possible to have these things but there is a lot more going on. So I just want to share, oh, let me share my screen again. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, so one of the things was, you know, you, you uh, uh, like 
you guys studied EMI and EMC, and you know you can see how all these things come together: information, material science, circuit analysis, electromagnetic theory. They all come together in you know um, when it comes to an actual industry, and you have the signal, you have the dielectric, and you have the return path, and you want to make sure that your return path is always what you desire and not what you you know not it's not going through some other coupled path which uh, which is undesirable so uh, so this is a picture so i'm going backwards but this is a picture of a six carrier dsm signal and you can kind of see you know uh, the intermodulation terms and you know im3s im5s you can see how, this is by the way something that is uh, with pre-distortion, which improves the emissions. But how is this actually? So this is what comes out of the antenna uh, of a base station. But if you go back and feel the layers and look at the power amplifier, so you can kind of see, you can kind of see the design. And, um, you know, this is the RF input. This is the RF output and you bias the circuits using these nodes here for the drain voltage and then you can see this is the input matching this is the output matching network and these are the devices that are being tested so this is a this is a an example of a doherty amplifier uh, but uh, i just wanted to give you a visual of what that looks like and so one of one of the one of the things areas of focus are circuit designing uh, from an application standpoint, but then you can go deeper into this, uh, into the device, which I'll show you. And this is again something, uh, this is again something that you will see uh, when you look at microwave oscillator and amplifier design that on the Smith chart, you can have many gain circles something for efficiency and power, and you can choose that to design an amplifier as per your requirements. Um, but... So here, if you go into the device, now you can see uh, the bond wires that are connected between the input lead. So this is the input side here. This is the output side, and this is the die. And so you can see multiple dyes are put together in that device there. And the whole idea is that uh, you have engineering teams that are tweaking this just to make sure that you get good gain, good power, good efficiency um, in high frequency ranges. You know, you have good high Q inputs and, you know, so this is basically looking at the matching network inside the package and, you have to try and make sure that these are very low Q, have very low inductance, you know. Um, so it's it's like a combination of microelectronics and uh, microwaves and RF. Um, so this is one area of application, uh, but. Uh, anyways, uh, so, so, you know, all these things come together and then you, you will actually test this and see, okay, does this actually work in the frequency range that uh, I designed it for? And uh, another way of visualizing it is from a circuit design standpoint is you look at another circuit and you look at it from, you know, an EM perspective and see if it's still uh, compliant you know, so you have your signal path and then you have another path. This is a, a balance design, but you know, uh, I go up, you can kind of see the circuit, you know, so this is being designed, simulated, and uh, you can kind of see the impedances that they're looking at. This is for a 600, megahertz or 400 to 600 megahertz design. And um, let me show you. So this is what a 
LTE or a WCDMA signal. LTE and WCDMA look very similar. Um, and so you can kind of see how the signal looks in frequency domain and um, this is again uh, for Doherty amplifiers and you can kind of see how the circuit looks and you know there are various things that you measure like gain, power added efficiency and these are all measured over microwave frequencies and like something fun. So that's all about circuit design um, and even going into the device uh, that you're working with. But something fun that is being worked on, it's still uh, not completed is, so we have our conventional microwaves and um, what is going on right now is uh, we're trying to use solid state devices so that you can actually uh, have smaller microwaves and also you can replace the klystron uh, at the back of the microwave with solid state devices which are smaller, which are more focused. And so you can cook your food better and not have uh, cold spots. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna tell you, show you something from a 5G perspective. So you saw those videos and you can kind of see all the different applications that are going to be controlled by 5G and uh, and, and millimeter wave in combination. And so, so you have all these different things that are supported like, you know, uh, OFTM and massive MIMO, which just means number of antennas are increased to increase coverage and capacity. Um, you have beam forming techniques where you change the phase shifters and to delay the signal so that you can bend the signal whichever way you want and you can switch beams whichever way you want. But all these, again, you know, uh, you can even analyze the channel response in an environment, you know, so you can see how it's very different at 24 gigs compared to when you're below six gigs. And then you can see the antenna patterns This is showing, so here. So this is what an LTE signal, uh, not an LTE. This is how a 5G NR signal looks like. So you have, each signal is 100 megahertz. So you have eight 100 megahertz carriers that are spaced together. And you can see the data rate that you get with that is about four, four gigabits per second. And this is, this is Qualcomm's phone and you can see the different uh, steps that uh, go on in verifying all this. And uh, you start from the user equipment, you do, you have a, um, a test station that keeps moving to capture the signal with a, with a uh, antenna on top. And then you test it in various environments, even in indoors, and then you uh, check if the beam the beam is tracking the user equipment everywhere, and one more try. Okay. There, there is there is a lot. There is just a lot going on right now. So you, this is another example of how you go from the power amplifier to the antenna element, and then if you add more antenna elements, and depending on how you control the phase. You can, you know, do beam forming and, you know, and there is a nice picture somewhere down here. Yeah, here. So this is being tested in an anechoic chamber where you have a, a, a base station, um, you have a cell phone, and then you're testing, um, what the signal integrity looks like and you know um, how much losses are you getting. So uh, this is actually what I wanted to show you. So this is a penny and the size of a penny is about quarter of an inch. And so you can see uh, the modules, the millimeter wave modules are so tiny. So this is almost one fourth uh, you know, of a quarter of an inch. So it's really, really small. 
and it's only getting smaller. And this slide is from 2018. So, you know, every year there's uh, huge progress is being made in reducing the size. And, you know, how you integrate that in, in a phone. And, um, okay, so. So this is, this is a nice picture to give an overview of what's going on. So this is, this is the high frequency band, which uh, there are new spectrums opening. Uh, and this is where the wavelength is between one to 10 millimeters. And then this is uh, uh, bands that are uh, sub six or less than six gigahertz. And so 5, 5G doesn't mean that we are not going to use these frequencies. These frequencies are also going to be used but when you need something that requires very high data rate, uh, you would switch to millimeter wave. But the idea in 5G is also that you're gonna use all these bands together uh, as you need it dynamically uh, to give uh, good data rates. And so let me show you. So this is a good picture again of, you know, it shows you how the base station is doing beam forming but even the mobile user is also doing beam forming. And so this way you can send and you can receive and then you can communicate and you can have communication between line of sight and non line of sight. And Okay, so, so this is again a good example of different applications where you can see, you know, when you have IoT devices, IoT devices are basically, uh, you know, things that are, they're called internet of things, but they don't require, things that don't require very high data rate, just require very slow uh, data rate, where they, you're just communicating the status, like, you know, your, uh, refrigerator telling you the food is cold or something like that. Um, and then you have the low band frequencies, less than one gigahertz, where you can get about 200 megabytes per second. Then you have, you know, your sub six frequencies where you can get two gigabits per second. Like this would be where, you know, you have LTE. But now what you can do is with 5G, you can have the massive MIMO patterns where you can have beam forming to increase the capacity and boost the capacity depending on the number of users. And then you have millimeter waves, which adds extreme data rates of 20 gigabits per second. So basically these all function together to give you the high speed uh, data rate. And so another, so this is, this is something that helps visualize when you add uh, more elements to an antenna, how the data rate is increasing. So you can see with one, one, uh, one element and one sector uh, uh, with 16 antennas, you can get about 200 megabits. But as you go to higher and higher, uh, you can get higher and higher data rates. Okay, I think I can keep going, but I, I want to give you uh, a chance to maybe, if you have any questions, I don't know. So I'll probably stop here. Uh, uh, but uh, just to just to summarize, you know, uh, hmm. there are all these concepts going together. There is a lot of work being done on integration of these chipsets, there is a lot of need for uh, RF and microwave design uh, right now, especially with all these new frequencies that are opening up and millimeter wave, there's a lot of work going on in millimeter wave. And uh, there's a lot that has been achieved, but there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. Uh, so, yeah. Did you guys have any questions or? Alan, I have a question. Okay. Uh, yeah, Frida, that's Frida speaking. Uh, I wanted to know, uh, 
like when you design for 70 gigahertz or higher in the 5G band, uh, when when somebody goes higher, I mean, uh, what are the design or what are the difference in design considerations that uh, if they exist, uh, like if somebody is working in X band or a C band and he has to switch to higher bands. Are there some drastic differences that a person has to consider in design? Uh, yes, I, I, I think one of the things was that as we go higher and higher in frequencies, the losses are very high. And so, uh, and even a uh, lot, of, lot of things like, you know, uh, we cannot, so the connectors that we use for testing can only be used one time or twice. Whereas when you're in lower frequencies, you can use the connectors as many times as you want because the gold or the plating on the connectors is not wearing out. But as you go close to 78 gigs, even simple things are so sensitive that you could be measuring something incorrectly and thereby throwing off everything. So, uh, and then EMI is a big thing because uh, as you go at those frequencies, uh, you can have all sorts of interference on the same board. And so to understand what is coupling from which section is also critical. And uh, like uh, some of the things would be, you know, measuring the return loss of the circuit, making sure there is nothing else, making sure uh, that one cavity is not uh, interfering with the other cavity so that if you have as an example, if you have transmitter, if you have the transmitter and the receiver on the same board, you want to make sure that your transmitter is not overpowering your receiver, thereby you're losing some sensitivity of the receiver. And so um, things like that, yeah. Uh, so what are the some difficulties you face while selecting a frequency band to be used in a heavily populated metropolitan area? Sorry, repeat your question again. Sorry, I didn't. So it's what are the difficulties you have faced while you have to select a frequency band which has to be used in populated metropolitan area? So uh, in a populated area, I think uh, one of the one of the challenges is uh, just capacity. Uh, uh, you know especially when you have a large amount of users, what you end up doing is you require a lot of, you need to find a way to increase the cell capacity. And otherwise users start dropping very easily. So one way you can do that is you can uh, add, you can add more base stations or you can do, you can deploy things like uh, beam farming and, uh, have a bigger network so uh, uh, you can have spatial multiplexing so that you can have you can have the same area but still use still add more users and still add more capacity and uh, you know one of the things one one of the reasons that's why uh, uh, massive MIMO is becoming very big when it comes to increasing the capacity and the data rate dynamically. Uh, you know, like with, for example, with, uh, if you have an antenna with 128 elements, now you have the option to send 128 beams, which are not as, which are, the power is still the same, but you can have 128 beams, or you can choose to just have one giant beam, you know, which is, which can reach a user very far away or which can reach a user which can give him very high data rate. So the, the way you handle it is you do, you steer the beam and you track the user uh, uh, on the go dynamically, depending on how they come in and go out of the sector. But now if you're talking about something like, say you have a big concert uh, or a cricket match, and you, you, you know that you'll always have, you know, so many people in the stadium. Uh, 
So in order to resolve that, what is usually done is you will have somebody like Airtel uh, bring a special uh, setup and they'll set up a lot of base stations and they'll set up a lot, they'll increase the capacity by a huge amount just so that every person texting or using their data or you know calling will not have their calls dropped. So, so those are two ways, but then you have the, uh, the other end of it where you have somebody in a rural area who is probably rarely using uh, data or rarely using his phone. There you want something that's extremely low frequency like uh, uh, 600 megahertz or 700 megahertz where the signal can travel really far. One of the drawbacks of this, uh, the frequency being higher is the losses are very high. So you need to add a lot of repeaters and you need to add a lot of base stations to uh, get things done. Sorry, that was a long answer to your question. So how significant was the gap between the concept that you taught in engineering versus the technology which is currently used in industry and what topics that universities can include to make this gap a little smaller? Uh, So uh, at, least, at least what I thought is, uh, so from an industry gap, I would just say that the big difference between, uh, I would say the gap usually is just in terms of, you know, actually getting to work on something with your hands. So I would say, you know, one of the keys would be projects, you know, if you have more projects that you can work on, then you can actually get your hands dirty. You can actually work on physically because uh, when you look at an application, the theory starts making more sense. But if you just look at the theory, it's hard to sometimes scratch uh, uh, the application. So the reason I was showing the 5G thing so much is I wanted to show, uh, you know, hey, this is what you're trying to achieve. But in order to achieve this, you need to have a backbone uh, and that backbone would have to be based on uh, microwaves or very high frequency uh, uh, hardware. And so, uh, but uh, I, for, personally for me, uh, what, what, what I have seen is what you learn in your bachelor's is more intensive than even what you would learn in your master's. Usually, if you do a master's or even if you're working in an industry, uh, you just go deeper in one section rather than learning everything. And so uh, that's one of the differences between if you are trying to pursue something specifically and going deeper in it. And, uh, but uh, as far as gaps, I would just think of it as I don't think there is any any uh, knowledge gap, I would say it's more like just, uh, I would just say it's projects or applications, working on, working on applications. So. so uh, during your college days, uh, what led you toward this RF field? What made you have an interest in this field? Um, I think, uh, you know, one was, I was always hungry. And so, you know, I was like, I need to understand how these, this microwave, no, I'm joking. Uh, uh, I, think, I think what led me was, I think, um, I think just, uh, uh, just, the, just, the, just the fascination to know how these things work, how an antenna works and why is it working that way. And, but I think more importantly was uh, just um, working with, you know, all the faculty, and uh, even I worked with Sundarajan sir a lot and I asked him a lot of questions and uh, that drove my interest too. But also, like I was saying, you know, working on projects helped me appreciate the concepts more. And, you know, and, and, and the most fun part was why was, you know, why was are where, you know, you really uh, come to know how well you know concepts. You know, and uh, uh, especially because uh, you know, uh, 
you come to know that you know how uh, as an example you know you come to know is one watt a huge amount of power you know or is 60 watts a huge amount of power you know uh, what 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 is right to have on your mobile phone you know and um, just drilling those concepts in in and you know um, yeah so what steps to be followed by an rf engineer in the industry while designing a new system and working with the different apart departments with a, within a company uh, i would say in terms of rf skills uh, so i would say something that would be core is electromagnetics is definitely core to understand i would say uh, digital communications is also something very critical to understand uh, because uh, everything is digital and you know and basically the digital signal uh, modulates the analog signal which is the RF and uh, so the analog portion is always going to be there but the analog portion has to work with the digital portion so that you don't have you have minimum amount of noise and you can recover your signal well. And so one of the skill sets would be digital communication. Um, I would say electromagnetics. I would say uh, uh, antenna and wave propagation. I would say mobile communication and principles of mobile communication is critical also because, and it's not just about mobile communication, it's because every Every communication uh, system is basically looked at as a radio, something that sends a signal or something that receives a signal. And so, uh, and so if you look at it that way as a radio, um, then you can kind of see, uh, you can apply these principles everywhere. So as long as you look at the whole thing as a communication block, where you start from the digital end, you convert it to analog, then you amplify the signal, then you filter the signal, you have a mixer or zero IF, and then in the end, you have an antenna that transmits the signal into the real world. So like, you know, like your Wi-Fi, your Bluetooth, all these are uh, uh, applications of uh, microwaves. And so, and another thing I would say is, uh, uh, would be microwave engineering is critical to understand, but it builds on uh, electromagnetics and antenna wave propagation, and even uh, uh, all these other concepts like you know uh, uh, that are linked to it would be microwave and oscillator amplifier design and um, RF circuit design. Yeah. Uh, now, if anyone from the participant wants to ask any questions to sir, uh, you can unmute yourself and you can ask a question. It seems there are no questions. So I would like to invite Madhvi ma'am and to say, like to invite Madhvi ma'am. Yeah. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is uh, Ms. Madhvi from Don Bosco Institute of Technology. I would like to thank uh, Alan, who is uh, one of the sincere, quite, and uh, one of the most favorite students of uh, all the faculties of uh, EXTC during 2004 to 2008. I do remember, uh, I can visualize uh, Alan is sitting on the bench and uh, we are teaching to him. I, I can still visualize. Okay, so that is the memorable moment uh, for us uh, as, a, as a teachers at Don Bosco East of Technology. So, all the students who are uh, who are uh, listening to Alan, okay, who is this guy? Uh, is explaining a lot of uh, like no uh, 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 information projects related to RF and microwave. 
okay some of the students uh, might have found a little difficult to understand it but uh, i would like to say few words about uh, alan okay so alan pereira is a 2008 uh, passed out student of uh, excc department okay he has completed his uh, be from dbit and uh, he has done his masters in electrical engineering um, in the university of uh, texas okay in uh, uh, arlington in usa at present he is working as a technical leader in rf design with nokia at texas in usa so in all so far he has a 9 years of industry experience in rf circuit design and development of prototypes from engineering and production so listening to his uh, uh, his session uh, everybody has learned that yes he is a very good expert in power amplifier designer with specialization in doherty design for ld mos and gan devices and pre distortion techniques to meet emissions and maximize efficiency so i can say that last no, last not but the least uh, alan has a patent on monitoring health of a pre distortion system so alan my dear i would like to thank okay thank you for the for your time i know it's a very early morning at your place and you have spent lot of time okay for our students so we would like to uh, know more from you okay maybe in the upcoming uh, sessions so thank you once again yeah thanks a lot yeah I, yeah yeah thank you for bearing with me <laughs> all the best <laughs> yeah thank you thank you ma'am so i would like to give a small word of thanks to our speaker i varun gokarda the vice chairperson of ieee dbit student branch would like to thank mr alan pereira on behalf of the ieee dbit mpts student chapter and entire excc department for taking out time from his busy schedule and conducting such an informative session for us i would like to thank our principal dr prasanna nabia our hod dr ashwini kota shetty and my entire ieee team of faculty and students for their constant support lastly i would like to thank all our participants for being a part of this event i hope this talk has helped you in a getting a better perspective about field of rf and microwave engineering hope you to see all to see you all in our further events as well you can follow our instagram page iiblee_dbit for regular updates thank you thank you yeah thank okay. you yeah. thanks alan this is very informative uh, varun you can stop the live streaming yeah